Hey, welcome everybody. This is Scott Jefferson with Ace of Systems. I want to welcome you to the second episode of the helicopter uh, track and balance equipment, Cobra 2 in tracks. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the tracks, app notes, and reports. As you see, this is a schedule coming up again today, the first June 4th, being the application notes. Uh, set on June 9th, we'll be covering tail rotor balance, and June 11th, the main rotor track and balance. And I believe Jared's going to be sending you something also where you can go ahead and pre-sign up for those, uh, those classes, those webinars, uh, so you get uh, some advanced placement. And for that, I'm going to turn this over to Todd Underwood, our helicopter uh, technical support guy, and he'll take it from there. Afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to episode two. As Scott said, we're going to be taking a look at application notes, uh, installation use of the tracks, optical tracker, and we'll be creating a report and going over what actually is in the report uh, for you guys to look at, provide to your customers. Um, application notes, we're gonna start with those. Um, this is kind of a paper webinar, uh, basically. It's a four-part series paper webinar. It contains pretty much everything you need to know in order to uh, install the equipment, what equipment's required, what abbreviations we may use uh, in the analyzer, uh, how to install? I don't know if they said that. How to install the equipment? Uh, provide procedures, diagrams, track installation dimensions. How to navigate the analyzer? How to load the setup? Step-by-step -step data collection, and we'll even throw in the end uh, some sample uh, solutions and how to enter your adjustments. So it's a comprehensive guide to the balance process. Uh, I have visited customers that didn't have one and, and had a lot of questions, and as soon as I printed one out and gave it to them, we started going through it. It pretty much answered all the questions that they had. So it's a great resource to have. Print it out, throw it in your kit, and, and keep it handy. Uh, of course, these are, there we go. Uh, these are available on the website. Once you register, of course, you can't register on the website until you buy a new system. That's right, that's right. Uh, once you become an ACES customer, you get uh, logged into the system, you have access to all the app notes and setups and uh, technical advice that's on the website. Uh, it is a PDF format, so when you download it, you can put it on a USB stick, you can carry it around with you, view it on any computer and print it out. Uh, we have between main rotor, tail rotor, and drive shaft, we have about 398 different application notes available. So we cover about everything that's out there. And I'm going to have Jarrett pull one up now, so we can just kind of go through it page by page and see what one looks like. So this one is for the AS350 main rotor. And if you'll notice, it's fairly new. I just updated it yesterday. The date on it, 1 June 2020. And as he scrolls down, there's some, uh, some legal ease down there at the bottom, copyright and so forth. The next page is going to cover what aircraft it applies to, uh, what kind of function it is, what revision it is, software, the, the version of the software. Uh, that, that's all kind of the, the bookkeeping section of it there. Another legal part introduction. We'll keep scrolling until we get to the good stuff. We're going to stop right here. So this is going to tell you all the equipment that's required to do the function that you're getting ready to go out and try and do. Main rotor, track and balance, tail, drive shaft, whatever it is. Uh, it's going to tell you how many, uh, the description of them, and the part numbers, part numbers of them. This is actually a document that sales uses a lot whenever you call up and you're looking for a quote and you have an AS350. This is what they're going to go to to get the part numbers in order to build your quote. So. If you remember earlier in the, the last webinar, I said they customize the kits. Uh, this is exactly how they do it. They go in there and see exactly what is required for that particular aircraft. Uh, and keep on scrolling down. If there's any miscellaneous items, we always put kind of a, a general statement in there about tie wraps and tape and so forth. Uh, sometimes there's some things in there this particular aircraft doesn't have any. Abbreviations. Again, this is uh, applicable to some aircraft, others it's not. It just depends on uh, kind of how things are in the setup and how we're presenting our solutions. But we're going to put a, a, an abbreviation list in there for the basic stuff that may come out as an abbreviation in the analyzer and want you, we want you to understand what it means. Uh, so we'll compile that list and put it up there in the front for you. Now we're getting into the equipment installation. So we have a step-by-step -step process. And if you notice in there, it'll refer to figures. A little bit lighter, a few more pages down, there's going to be some, uh, some illustrations of how to install your vibe sensors, how to install your 
uh, your photo attack if you're using it or your mag pickup. Uh, you know, we're, we're not going to tell you how to route your cables. We're just going to tell you to route your cables safely. We know you guys are qualified and smart mechanics and you can figure out how to get your cables from point A to point B. Uh, we will tell you, obviously, which one to connect to which with the part numbers. And if you keep scrolling down a little bit, there's all the sensors. The tracks will kind of, uh, and that's, scroll back up a little bit, Jarrett. That needs to be updated. I, the tracks, the installation procedures are in the diagram and they're also in the user's manual. Uh, that says connect in accordance with the user's manual. The user's manual, again, is just like all these other documents, it's available for download off the website. Uh, and when we get to the tracks, we'll go through some more of that. Um, keep scrolling down. Reinstall any. So here you get to the diagrams and the pictures. Sometimes it's a photo. Uh, sometimes it is a, uh, an actual diagram, just depending upon what kind of resource we have for that. So there's the blades, there's the, your sensors and the mag pickup, and your next your lateral sensor. And here you get the illustration for the tracks. Uh, in the user's manual, it says mount it as low as possible in the, in the window. Uh, these dimensions we derive from a process that we're going to go over here in a little bit from uh, trying to figure out where, to, where the mast center line is, where we're mounting the mast, or where they're mounting the tracks, and then the uh, inclination of the tracks in order to aim it at the right place. Uh, we've done this for pretty much all the aircraft, so if there's an app note and a setup on the website for your aircraft, you don't have to worry about trying to figure out these numbers. They're already embedded in the setup. You just have to install the tracks in the appropriate position. There's a small quick reference guide uh, for the navigating the analyzer, what the keys do, the, the main function keys there, whether it be uh, dim the lights, switch it to day-night mode, your arrows, your home key, just as a quick reference guide. The setup configuration, this gets into something else we've already covered a little bit. It's a step-by-step -step walking you through downloading the setup off the website and then getting that set up onto the analyzer using the USB drive. So there's some step-by-step -step and a few screenshots there showing you the process, walking you through it. We've tried to make it as easy as possible by including the screenshots uh, so you've got the, the words and the pictures. Now at that point, you've got your equipment installed, you've got your setup on your analyzer, you know how to use your analyzer, you're ready to rock and roll, you're ready to go start collecting data. So what we've done is basically just taken a screenshot from every page that you would go through in the analyzer during the job. Once you've selected main rotor, you've selected start job, and then the next page is you're going to choose what aircraft you're going to do. On that next screen right there, uh, the customer information screen, that's a screen that gets bypassed a lot. We don't, uh, it's not mandatory to put information in there. We don't force you to put anything in there. I highly recommend it for a couple of reasons. If you're doing work for an external customer, you can use their name, use the, the reg of the aircraft and the hours for record keeping. If you're just doing your own aircraft, a lot of people bypass this. Uh, the, the fault of that is when you go back to review jobs, if you pause the job and you want to go back and review it later, if you don't put anything in that block for the customer name, it's simply going to show up on the list of jobs as unnamed. They will be in... Uh, chronological order, right, so the newest one will be up top, but if you have 10 unnamed jobs in there, it, it gets a little difficult to find the particular job you may be looking for. So, I recommend naming that however you prefer, uh, but that, like I said, it won't stop you from pressing forward. If you just press OK, you're going to go to the next screen. Next screen is going to give you a couple, uh, a couple of reminders. It's going to tell you, hey, make sure your channel A is hooked to vertical, your channel B is hooked to uh, lateral. I can't see it the other one. Um, it's also, now on that, because I took that screenshot using a, a virtual machine, basically on my computer, where it says tra uh, tracking device, right, hard for me to see from over here, it will, there you go, when you're in the analyzer, because the analyzer auto detects what tracking device is detected, it's going to say right there either strobe or tracks. I, I whited it out because on my device it says simulation. So. When you're using it on the aircraft, whatever you connect, it's going to detect and then it will display the name right there. So once you've got all your sensors hooked up, you verify it here, you verify the tracks is good, you press OK and you come up to the condition screen where we're all familiar with 
what conditions we're going to run and check vibration and track at. After you press OK, again, this is just kind of walking through the process in the analyzer. We're going to do this again when we do main order track and balance, but it's going to be live. I'll use a simulator and we'll, uh, we'll see the numbers moving and we'll make some adjustments and see the process live. Uh, but that's what this app note does. It just walks you through step by step. So now we're collecting data. We're going to keep scrolling. Once we've take, taken that first uh, conditions data, it shows you the results of that run, with your vibration up top and your blade track information down below with the blade track uh, picture. At that point, if you're happy with that, uh, there's options on that screen. If you're not happy with it or you think you know you got a gust of wind, the pilot kicked the pedals, you could go ahead and hit retake blade track, you could retake vibe, or you can retake both. Uh, if you're happy with those re results, you think it was a good, uh, a good run, press OK and you'll move on to the next screen. Now you're going to keep doing that. As you notice, the ground now has an X in it. That means we've collected data for it uh, and we're ready to move to the next one. So you're going to keep going through these, uh, every condition and collect data as needed. Once any of the uh, things that we're monitoring, uh, vertical, lateral, and track, once any of them are out of limits, uh, an adjust button will pop up underneath F2 on your soft keys down there, and then that will allow you to make adjustments. If that key isn't there, what we're monitoring so far, nothing is out of limits. Just a warning here. Um, so the analyzer is a single adjust analyzer and it, you cannot make multiple types of adjustments. You can, but you have to understand the impact. So you can make five pitch link adjustments on one run or five tab adjustments on one run or add weight to five different blades on one run. But it's not recommended to adjust two tabs, adjust two uh, pitch links and add a little bit of weight on the fifth blade if I was on an MD500 with five blades. Um, we, we don't know, we can't predict what the outcome of that would be in this model of analyzer. So we popped that warning up there. Now that's not saying some of you guys can't do two adjustments on the ground the first run and do a track and maybe a little bit of weight. If you're experienced and you know what you're doing and you know what the outcome is. If you do, we give you the option by pressing the all adjust button down there at the bottom and then it's going to let you do both adjustments. If you don't press that, it's going to allow you to do one adjustment once you're done making that adjustment, you press OK, it's going to start run two. So it's going to kind of skip the other adjustments uh, to force you in that. Keep scrolling down. Uh, that's basically the red, in red is kind of what I just said. There's some warnings and some notes towards the end of it. Uh, then we get into solution examples. Keep scrolling down. And these will appear, so you've ran, you've got a choice of adjustments. Again, this is where it's kind of up to the mechanic. If you look at it and you know your track's out, your lateral's out, and your vertical's out, well, it's up to you to choose which one to work first. It's up to the aircraft manual, reading the aircraft manual, knowing your aircraft, and, and knowing the process of track and balance and how to start working it. So we don't uh, choose the adjustment for you. We provide them, and then you make them. Scroll down to the next page. And once you chose the, the I can't see that one. What was that? Lateral? Scroll in. Or zoom in. There you go. Thanks, Jerry. Pitch link. Okay, so the first one was chosen was pitch link, right? Ground, hover through pitch link, or ground through hover, pitch link, and it's flats. Uh, so the suggested adjustment was minus 4.23 flats, which we obviously know you can't do 0.23 flats. So you're going to round these. Again, this is where the, the experience of the mechanics going to. Uh, play in. So you're going to do a minus 4 on the red and it looks like minus 4.76 on the blue. So you could round that one up to minus 5 flats. And these are just examples uh, just to kind of give you an idea of what it looks like when you get an adjustment and where you enter it. Scrolling down. Same thing. Uh, oh, that's with it. Okay, that's showing the adjustment in. And then this is just another one. This is a weight adjustment. Uh, AS350 actually uses plates. That's what that PLP means. I'll just touch on, and again, this is just a replay of the same thing. I'll just touch on, if, scroll back up, Jared, a little bit, right there. If you, I see a lot of jobs where I know that the user has implemented one of the adjustments, but they don't tell the analyzer what they did. 
So I know that because I can look at the data and I can see the blades have moved, or the vibration is, has reduced, or the vibration has moved in clock angle. But yet, when you go to the installed block, and you'll see this when we look at the report, there's nothing there. So that, if you don't tell the analyzer what you're doing, you're not going to get predictable solutions past that run. Because what happens is the analyzer, it learns, it's paying attention to what you're doing. If you tell it nothing, but yet you go make an adjustment and everything changes, now it's like, okay, wait a minute. You didn't make an adjustment, but everything changed. Let me recalculate. Let me try and figure out what's going on here. So uh, as my buddy Josh likes saying, garbage in, garbage out, right? It is a computer. You have to tell it what you're doing to get good, predictable results. So once you make an adjustment, enter it into the analyzer. If you don't like the adjustment, that's fine. If you want to make a different adjustment, way less, way more, based on your experience on that aircraft, that's fine. Just tell the analyzer what you're doing, right? Put the actual adjustment in the installed column, and you'll end up getting much better results. And that's kind of a quick job. Once everything's all done, uh, you'll get this screen. Once everything's all within limits, you've made your adjustments, it's going to say, hey, everything's good, and you're going to hit F5, quit job to mark the job complete and save it. Once you do that, you won't be able to resume that job anymore. It will be available for review and download and to create a report, but you won't go back, be able to go back in there and start another job. All right, let's see. What's next? That's, that's the app notes, pretty much. Like I said, they're, they're a great asset to have. Uh, we put a lot of work into them, trying to make them um, user-friendly, easy to follow. Um, any suggestions you have on your particular aircraft on an app note, app note if you've got uh, questions about it or any, any way we can improve it, shoot it to me. We'd be, we're welcome for, uh, we, we, we definitely welcome feedback on them. Um, but more often than not, I, 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 you know who you are. I don't see you using them. They're not, you guys don't print them out. I bring them with me. <laughs> My pet peeve. So uh, let's move on. I think we're on to tracks now, right? I'm waiting for him to click it. There we go. So now we want to talk about the tracks. As you can see it, nice pretty little track sitting right here. It's lightweight, compact, optical tracker. Uh, huge benefit. From, okay, so I haven't told you anything about me, but I worked in MH53 payblows for years, and putting tip targets on a payblow, I don't remember how many, it, it, there's obviously 12 screws, two screws per blade, six blades, and usually you end up with about 10 strip screws because we haven't had them on and the screw heads are worn off and they're corroded. So every time we go put tip targets on, you got strip screws, pain in the butt. With this tracker, no tip targets. Uh, there are other trackers out there that require you to paint the blades prior to doing your tracking. This tracker does not. Uh, it's very easy to install. It's a suction cup and a little lever. Stick it on the window. Clip the lever, sorry, wrong camera. Little suction cup, little lever, and it's ready to rock and roll. Uh, it's a flexible mount, so it's easy to adjust your inclination once it's up there. And it's actually it's a, it's a fairly firm mount, so uh, you know once you get it adjusted, if you uh, don't bend it from there, you'll have it pretty much uh, set for the next time you use it. You'll need to double check it with your inclinometer, but it stays uh, pretty good in the same position. Stop. Don't move. So. By using an optical tracker like this, mounting it in the same place, it's very reliable, very repeatable, and it collects data very fast. And this also was a patented, right? So these guys, uh, prior to me working here at ACES, they got together and decided to build this thing, and they've got some patents on it, or a patent on it, uh, under the category of technology for systems and methods of tracking rotor blades, and that there's a patent number. If you ever want to read about it, it's about 40 pages on Google. That's all, sorry, drop my, all in engineer speak, so it's a little boring, but if you need something to put you to sleep at night, it should be something great to read, but it is patented. So we're going to talk about a couple of different things. The, the tracks user manual has basic general information for installing the tracks. You would need to use a user manual if you didn't have a setup with the tracks information in it. Uh, there's only a few cases where that's, uh, that, that would happen. Uh, possible if you're a 2020 guy and you're just upgrade to the tracks, you might have to enter that information if we don't have it or if we've never been on that particular aircraft. 
We've actually been on pretty much all of them, so we have most of the data. And when we get the data, we're going to put it in the application note, right? So the specific installation diagram, like I just showed you with the, in, the, uh, the dimension for your incline and the inches to mass center line are in the setup and they're in the app note. So you know where to install it and what angle to put it at. Again, like I said, suction cup mount, quick and easy. Uh, a lot of people don't trust it. I've flown around, I don't know how many times now in the last two and a half years. I've yet to have it fall out. Uh, if it's put on there uh, properly, that suction cup works really well. And I've flown in some rough aircraft that it, it shakes around a little bit, but it does the job. Yeah. Todd, we have a question from Eric. It says he's asking about counterclockwise aircraft. Mm -hmm. That's all, yes, he said. I thought he was uh, just about. I guess maybe installation for a counterclockwise. It's, it's exactly the same. It, it, no difference. The uh, difference comes in the setup that we went over the other day. Uh, we're going to put in there clockwise, counterclockwise by numbering the blades, putting the blades in the correct order so it'll know how to pick them up. So okay. the tracks, uh, I'm going to show you here in a few minutes how it actually cap captures or what it's looking at, uh, but it doesn't care which way they're going. That's determined inside the analyzer itself. So this is the, the screen of information that, and we went over this the other day in the setup, right? The tracking setup. Went over the main rotor setup, and one of the pages in there is a tracking setup. This is the information the tracks needs to, uh, to track the blades. And know where the tracks is and understand the angle of the um, tracks itself in relative, where it's aiming on the blade. If you didn't have the information already in your setup, this is how you would determine it. You would figure out where the extended center line of your mast is. You would measure forward to where you have decided to mount uh, your tracks, which is at the lowest, most forward part of the windshield. That would give you your inches to mast center line. The next step would be to aim the tracks a third of the way back from the tip cap. Like I said, generally the uh, trim tab area figure out what the incline is, and then you're going to enter that into the setup. That would be if you're building your own. And like I said, all this information is in the user's manual. We've done all that for you by providing it. All you have to do, you may, the first time you install it, and that take a tape measure uh, for the 110 inches, figure out where that's at, make, like, take a Sharpie, something, make a little mark on the window, something small that's not going to bother anybody, or Struck the pilot's vision, don't be making a big arrow on there or anything. And then uh, from that point, you, you know where to put it every time, and all you got to do is figure out okay, get my inclinometer 46 degrees, and you're ready to go. Where are we going? Aiming the tracks. Get a lot of questions about that, right? So, this is an example of most of helicopters in the world number one blade over the nose during the tack event. We, we understand you can't aim it dead on 12 o'clock, just, just uh, you know, the center console's there, you're not going to be aiming it that way. If you could zoom in on that, Jared, a little bit, the little box at the top there, uh, under, yeah, that right there. With the blades in the position when the attack event occurs, I can barely read that. That's fine. So what it's telling you is, we want you to aim 15 degrees ahead of the static location of the number one blade. So basically just aim slightly off to the left of the number one blade when it's at the 12 o'clock position. That gives a great field of view for the tracks. Now again, somebody asked today about how critical it is to mount the tracks in the exact right spot. It, it, it's important for consistent results. If you're a little bit off to the left or a little bit off to the right, it's not going to be catastrophic. You're going to have to get a long ways off in order to catch the wrong blade. But for the best consistent results, about 15 degrees to the left of the 12 o'clock position when the number one blade is there is the preferable aiming. So now you know the incline of it, and you know, pointing out the nose, how you're going to aim it left to right. Now, there's a few aircraft out there, and this is something else we kind of covered in the, going through the main rotor setup that require a little offset. Bell 407 is one of them. Uh, I haven't ran into too many other ones, but I'm sure they're out there. So this is when the main rotor blade, the number one main rotor blade, is either prior to or after the tack event. So it passes the, tra the tracks, and then the tack event happens. It's not lined up. So 
we have to put blade one offset in the setup to tell the tracks where the blade is. This was a huge problem on the Bell 407 because essentially we had customers catching the number two blade and it was very difficult to track and balance the aircraft when you're always making adjustments on the wrong blade. So that's built in there in order for us to fine tune and uh, make sure the tracks knows where the blades are. Another question that came up the other day is about the sun. And the customer that brought it up was actually doing the exact right thing. He said sometimes, you know, we get the message that it's not detecting the blades, possible too bright a sun, pick the aircraft up, turn it a little bit. Uh, you're going to have that when the sun is directly in line with the tracks. The, the little picture down there at the bottom right corner, chamber one, chamber two, and detector, that shows how. There's, there's a little obstruction in there to try and get the light to dif diffract and you know, not go straight into the detector. But if the sun is lined up right down that little tunnel, it's going to bleed out the signal to the detector. So not a big deal. Move the aircraft. Uh, it is very common with all optical type trackers uh, to have that kind of issue. Once your track is, tracks is hooked up, and we talked about this, right, it auto detects, the software auto detects, so there's no other configuration required. You don't have to go in and change the setup or tell it or turn it on or anything else. There's three lights on top of the tracks, and they're going to indicate power. So the left-hand light is blue, indicates the unit is receiving power from the analyzer. Now, I should have put that bottom line up there a little bit higher. Power of the tack is only supplied when the unit is taking vibration and track measurements. So just because you have the tracks connected to the analyzer and the analyzer is powered on does not mean you're getting power to the tracks. It doesn't get power until you start collecting data. Right? So I've had people call up, say, hey, plugged in, they don't get any lights. That's perfectly normal until you start collecting data. Once you start collecting data, then the power light's going to come on. The center light, the tack light, is an amber light, and it's going to indicate the status of the tack signal. That light's going to flash approximately half the rate of the rotor when it's spinning. So once you get your power light, your spinning rotors, you're going to see that thing start flashing. The ready light is the right-hand light, and that's the green light. Now that's going to indicate everything is working, right? We've got power, we've got good tack, and we're ready to start taking track data. So that's kind of the lights on top that you'll see flashing and doing different things while you're running. Um, the illumination of the ready light actually confirms a lot of things. Uh, it confirms it's a reading an RPM signal from the tax source. It's uh, identifying the correct number of blades. So it, if you got a 860, it's got four blades. It needs to see four blades. Um, that, that's going to tell you most likely if you if you doesn't, you've got the, something wrong in your setup or you chose the wrong setup. Signal strength from the blade pulses is adequate for a good reading. In other words, you've got good contrast between the sky and the blade. You're reading the blades really well, and power is being sent to the tack circuit by the analyzer itself. And again, this is only the case during vibration and track measurements. So only when you're collecting data do you get power. I, I joke about engineers. Sorry, is there any engineers online? Tell us in the chat bar. Any engineers? This is a, a picture out of, actually out of the patent uh, that was sent in for the tracks. It's basically showing time in cone. Uh, it's, there's two field of view uh, detectors or photo detectors in the tracks and this is how an engineer would look at it or we would display it if we wanted to send it to an engineer. And if you wanted to explain it to a crew chief, you'd do it this way. So the longer the blade is in the cone, the higher it is, right? Because so that, that's what it's measuring. It's measuring how long it stays in the cone. Blade one is in the cone longer. As the cone gets wider towards the top, it's in there longer. That's how the track identifies, uh, the, or measures the track of the blades. It's a pretty cool concept. Like I said, I can't read all that, but it, it, I can supply, su supply it to anybody if they want to peruse. That was kind of quick. That was the tracks. I wanted to mention again, though, don't forget. Maybe. Jared's hijacked my thing again. 
I wanted to mention again, warranty support and service, like I said, is something else we're really proud of. Now, industry leading five year warranty, that's on the Cobra. The Trax has a one year warranty, Scott? Yes. Sir. Yeah, one year warranty. 24 uh, 7 product technical support, five day turn time on services calibration and expedite services are always available. Just wanted to make sure we uh, mentioned that. Dan B is an engineer, is, yes. is what I just heard. So uh, thanks for tuning in, Dan. We wanted to, I wanted to cover reports too. It's something I use all the time when guys send me jobs that I need to look at or they're having some kind of issue. I'll go in and I'll create a report off of that job and then it prints the, a PDF and it makes it a lot easier to kind of look at things. Uh, it does a couple different things. It, it's very easy to do. It's downloaded to the USB device. It provides you a lot of information. It tells you about the analyzer, what software version you're using, the cal date, the setup that was being used, all the job data that was collected, any adjustments that were made with polar chart views. And for customers, you know, if you're doing external customers, it's a great document that when you're done, print this out, hand it to them, put it in the logbook, and they've got all the numbers uh, to prove that the aircraft is what it is. I've got another question. Okay. Said uh, here, does it, does it measure leading, uh, I guess, uh, trailing or, or center blade? Lead lag, yes. Yeah. It, it'll display, let's see, was a, do we have a picture of that? We do. Oh, it's in the app note. Pull the app note up. Yeah, and scroll up. Keep going up, keep going up. I'll tell you when to stop. We're almost there. You see one with the blades on it. That's where you need to stop. Right there. All right. Go back down. Zoom in on that, please. There you go. So, as you can see, click off of it. Oh, there you go. Oh, you're moving. Sorry. Okay. So, you can see this was run one where we collected data on the ground, right? So, whoa, whoa, I'm getting dizzy. <laughs> it's going to show you the RPM. Uh, the next lines are vertical vibration and the clock angle that it was measured at, the lateral vibration, the clock angle was measured at. The next uh, category is your lead lag, right? So it's going to show, uh, basically showing one is zero, two is zero, and three is uh, 0 0.5. Uh, the center line, if you look at the diagram where the blades are, where the zero goes uh, horizontally, there's the center line, and then there's in each uh, block for red, yellow, and blue, there's also a center line coming down vertically. And you can tell the blue is shifted off of that, that line. Um, so that displays your lead and lag. The bottom, obviously, is your tracking. And that's going to show the numbers for those. And again, remember, those numbers, it, on this screen, it doesn't say inches or metric or millimeters. You know that the setup you're using is in inches or metric. So all the numbers in that setup are going to excuse me, be displayed that way. Good question, though. Back to the report. Back to the report. That's me now. Huh? Oh, sorry. Okay. Cardini asset. Cardini's been in all of these. He must like us. Uh, okay, so we went over this. This is creating reports easy. I'm going to do one. Uh, if I'll create a uh, report real quick on the analyzer, and then we'll review it. We are on the analyzer? We are. Okay. So, I should start talking there, right? Main order track and balance. We're going to press OK. And then we're going to go to Manage Jobs, press OK, and Create Report. It's going to generate a list, there's only one in here, uh, of un, or of a, a name. This was unnamed. I could condemn myself for not naming my job. Um, it's going to provide a list of all the jobs that are in there, okay, in a, in a chronological order. So. We're going to click on that one, so that's the one we want, and it's going to create the report. Once it says report created, you can press continue and go back and create another one if you'd like. At this point, you can just hit the home key because that's the only one we're going to do. We're going to press home, and then we're going to hit F1 transfer report. report. At that time, it'll go to the USB drive, and it'll be stored in a folder on the USB drive called aces underscore reports. 
I've got one that uh, Jared's going to pull up here. We'll just kind of. No worries, no worries. It's that image to the left is what it sort of looks like. But we're going to pull one up and just run down it. So, like I said, it includes pretty much everything that was used for this job. Uh, you have the customer's name, when it was started, uh, when it was last updated, the aircraft tail number, what is the job status? Is it complete? Is it incomplete? The aircraft hours. You've got all the analyzer information, so especially if you're providing this to an external customer, hey, look right there, my, well, my cal dates out of cal, but that's, that's my old analyzer here on the desk that we don't use on aircraft. So, But it will show your calibration date, the serial number. Uh, if, if you have put your owner information and address in there, there's a place to store all of that also, phone, email, uh, so your customer also has a way to contact you there. The policies, that's uh, what we establish, whether or not we allow people to copy, delete, update the ICFs. Uh, that's not something that you would mess with, but it tells you what that setup, what, how it's configured. The setup itself is below that, telling you that it's an AS350, what channels, what type of mag was used. Everything uh, that is significant from the setup is in that report right there. And then if you keep scrolling down, you'll see the chart. You'll see multiple charts for whatever we needed to have in there. We had a vertical one, we had a lateral one, we had a tracking. And then you get down here and you'll get three different areas. Uh, scroll up just a touch. Keep going. Right there. So we did four runs. And on this, you'll notice this is what the vibrations are, right? You'll notice run one only covered ground and hover. So if you look at ground, run number one, the vertical was pretty high. So we did ground, we did hover for run one, and then we stopped and made an adjustment. That's why you only see ground and hover on run one, and then you start seeing uh, ground and hover again on run two. So they stopped, made an adjustment. Ground, you can see whatever adjustment they made there, you can see a reduction because it went from 1.02 to 0.39. And so they did ground hover again, and felt comfortable enough to go on to MCP and collect some data, which moved us to run three. So I always tell people, you know, we recommend collect all the data that you can. In other words, even if you're just to touch out of limits, if you're like 0.22, go fly and collect data. Fly to where you feel safe, because the more data that you collect, the better. Uh, if it's really rough, stop, make an adjustment enter the adjustment, press OK, it's going to start run two. I see a lot of times uh, the alternative to that is, is a bad way to do it, which is starting a new job every time. We don't want to do that because whatever the analyzer has learned, you lost. So if you do run one and exit the job, make the adjustment, start a new job, you're not gaining anything. You're not collecting uh, data. You're not compiling that data so the analyzer can learn and you'll, if you wanted to look at the report, you'd have to have to look at each job report instead of having it all be compiled on one. Uh, so you keep scrolling down. That's the vibration levels. You can see they keep going down through four. We have the tracking, same thing. It's going to show you the track picture for each uh, condition that was collected. For each blade through all the runs. And then it's also going to show the lead lag. And then the next category, stop right there, is the solutions. So here you can see on run one, the two solutions that were recommended. The user chose to do the lateral, and you can see what they chose to put in there, right? So it was red one, or red blade was plus 147 plat, 1.47 plates, sorry. They decided to do two because they don't want to cut the plates in half. Makes sense. And you can see that they put three on the blue, and at that point, pressed OK and started run two. And so as you scroll down, you'll see this was repeated for each run, any adjustment that was made, including the track adjustment that are made uh, for the last one. And then if you keep going down, you'll start seeing some pictures, some polar chart views. of That one was of, scroll back up just a little bit, eh, right there. Each one will tell you a little synopsis of what it's uh, telling you, and it's going to tell you what aircraft and stuff again. But it's also going to tell you the most important thing is what channel it was, vertical, and what condition it was, ground. 
So then keep going down and you'll see the next one is for ground and lateral. And you're also going to have the vibration ips and then the effective uh, move line, right? So you'll have that for each condition. I believe if I'm stating this correctly that an adjustment was made on. This is what, when you generate a port report in the analyzer, sometimes it takes 10, 15, 20 seconds. If you've got a lot of runs, it has to generate a lot of polar chart views at the end of it, so it may take a little while to, to actually generate. But it provides a lot of information, good resource. Um, like I said, I use it all the time. I've got my phone blowing up. I don't know if somebody's asking me something or asking you guys something. I think that's reports. Any questions on reports? No? What else do we have? I think I might be. Those are screenshots that we didn't use because we used the analyzer. Next week, we're going to cover Tell Rotor. So I've tried to kind of been building for the first two weeks to try and go through the analyzer and the basic processes. And again, I don't know which camera I'm looking at, Jarrett. Over here? Over there. Cool. Uh, I've tried to build so we could get a good understanding of the analyzer and the basic functions, the app notes, the setups. Uh, so those these last two episodes may not have been the most exciting things, but I wanted to build that base of knowledge. So the next two, uh, next tail rotor balance next week on Tuesday, and then main rotor balance uh, to finish off on Thursday. I wanted to spend pretty much that whole time just going through the process on the analyzer. Of course, unfortunately, I can't bring, they won't let me bring a helicopter in here. I don't know. They don't understand. But I'll be doing it on my analyzer using a simulator, but you'll be seeing live data on the screen, and we'll make adjustments, and we'll walk through the whole job, and hopefully that's really beneficial in, in uh, capturing all that we've already learned and, and then putting it together and showing it in one, in one application. Uh, so that's what I'm looking forward to on Tuesday's tail rotor balance. And I think that leads us up to? What everybody's favorite. Final <laughs> thoughts with Scott. I don't know about favorite, but yeah. Well, thanks for the well, yeah, thanks for the promo. <laughs> the uh, one of the things I want to discuss real quick. Uh, Todd provides a lot of information. There's a lot of uh, involvement, of course, with helicopters, rotor wing. Uh, that is very important uh, to learn. Again, especially using uh, whether it's our tracks and the Cobra Two system, uh, or uh, other other reports and things like that that you need to put in the logbooks. The uh, one of the things that came up earlier when I was talking about trading in your older 2020s was that uh, is it just the uh, um, I guess our equipment that you can trade in? We do take other our competitors' equipment in on trade for discounts and so forth. Uh, sometimes it helps uh, that, uh, for the final end cost. So if you if you have somebody else's equipment interested in trading it in for our Cobra 2 kit, please let us know. You can always contact sales at Asus Sales at AsusSystems.com. And if you have another technical, or if you have a technical question regarding this uh, presentation, or if you've got you know the equipment itself, just please contact support at asasystems.com. Uh, anytime you want to reach us by phone, you can call 865-671-2003, and ask for sales or technical support using that. Again, thank you all so much for attending this week, and look forward to seeing you again next Tuesday.